Yeah, uh, hi uh, again. I'm Jasper. With me, I have Mark and Florian uh, from the Hammock Bitbots, and uh, we're going to talk a bit about our software and how we got uh, second place. Um, yeah, so uh, first of all, I'll give a short introduction about how our team kind of works as an as a organizational unit. Um, uh, then uh, Mark will give a brief introduction in the general structure of our software uh, and talk a bit about the motion part, how robots are able to uh, do the things they do. Uh, then Florian will uh, talk a bit about how uh, the robots can uh, actually see and perceive the environment, what kind of strategies we uh, applied there. And uh, lastly, I'll talk a bit about the uh, behavior part of our robots and how they make their decisions. Uh, so first off, this is our team. Uh, this was last year in, uh, in the virtual world, I guess. And uh, this was just a few days ago at the German Open Replacement event, uh, which was really nice to have a, like a kind of almost a real competition, unfortunately, without any other teams from the Humanoid League. But um, yeah, we had a really good time there. And uh, we are really looking forward to Bangkok now. Uh, so yeah, our team is basically a, a student working group. So everybody, almost everybody here, is a um, is a student at the University of Hamburg, and uh, they are usually in their bachelor or master. And then we have two PhD students, so they are basically university employees, uh, and they are uh, they are Mark and Niklas, who is not here right now, um, and they are yeah basically paid by the university and uh, their job is not just to work for the team but also guide uh, the students a bit um, in getting stuff uh, published uh, in, in growing basically as a researcher uh, so we are funded by our university and sometimes by uh, sponsoring uh, mostly basically by our university um, and we try to meet once a week for for coding uh, for progressing on our software and we also meet once a week for doing organizational stuff um, where we are basically yeah <laughs> trying to keep the team alive and do what's required uh, for example to go to bangkok uh, uh, we have a, a time tracking system which has helped us quite a lot um, where people just put in the the hours they spent on the project they spent on um, for example, writing software or holding a talk at the Humanoid League virtual season workshop. Uh, and this kind of helps us to be honest to ourselves about how much everybody has done. Uh, and yeah, it's also kind of an incentive to do more um, for everybody to, yeah, to also recognize, oh, this person is so active at the moment. I, I want to be as active as well. Uh, yeah, lastly, uh, we have kind of this motto of public money means public code. So everything we do, which is uh, not a password, uh, we try to share. Um, so we want to yeah, make sure that because we get the money by the university and the university is paid by everybody in Germany, uh, we also want to make this available to everybody. And while we're at it, why not the world and not just Germany? Um, so yeah, this is kind of our motto and that's why everything we do is uh, open source. Yeah, so Mark will now uh, give you a bit of an overview of our software structure. I let him move over. <laughs> a little bit of a rotation maneuver. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so our software structure um, is based on ROS2. This is um, quite a new change uh, for us. So in the past we have used ROS1 and uh, during the last year we, we are now changing to ROS2 and most of our code is now uh, running in ROS2. Um, and we try to keep our software modular. So we try to make small ROS nodes. So some teams tend to do all their motion parts, for example, in one node. That's something we do differently. We will see also a little bit more details in a second. Um, and our goal is that um, we want to make our software usable. And, and it's not just for us, but more generally. So it's um, important for us that it is modular and uh, of course everything is open source as Jasper already said um, and we do all our code and development um, on github so um, it is also easy for other teams to open an issue if they have some issue with our software or they can 
um, really see what we are working on currently and so on. So we are very open with this and uh, yeah, so you can have a look um, if you want at our code. Um, we program um, in Python and in C++. So Python is used for um, mostly for the behavior and uh, partially for the vision. And uh, C++ is uh, used for the motion parts and the hardware control. Yeah, so our motion, so we have basically three main motions. Um, so walking, standing up and kicking, um, similar like most teams, I would say. Um, all of those, we um, basically, um, for those we use Cartesian quintic splines. So a spline is um, a definition. Um, so you define a spline by defining certain key points and then uh, you interpolate uh, between those. And in, in, in the quintic spline, um, you define the position, the velocity, and the acceleration. And this leads to a very smooth movement. Um, you can see on the bottom this image here. For It's an example from our robot standing up in, uh, in PyBullet. Um, and you can see basically the splines for one arm and for, for one leg, only for the positions of those. Um, and you can see that those are quite smooth curves. And this is quite. Uh, nice for movements because, uh, yeah, they if the movement is smooth, it's typically also more stable. Um, this approach is, uh, yeah, basically inspired by the work um, of Team Roban um, a few years back, which used a similar approach for their walking. Um, but of course, there are a lot of parameters that uh, you end up with uh, using such an approach. Um, and for this, we um, did some automatic parameter optimization. Um, I will not go into details because I will do a talk uh, uh, on Saturday. Um, so tune in if you want to know more about that. Um, yeah, and those blinds are, of course, um, basically an open loop pattern generator. Um, so we need some kind of stabilization. And we do this uh, on the one hand by using some simple PID controllers that control the orientation of our torso. Um, based on the IMU data and on phase modulation. So phase modulations means we end, for example, the step, uh, the step of the walking earlier if we uh, measure with our foot sensors that we make ground contact or we uh, make the step longer if we do, did not have yet made ground contact. We also have um, some other motions like uh, waving and cheering. Uh, where we still use um, keyframes in joint space, uh, what we use basically the approach that we used before, but those is just for very uh, simplistic motions. Yeah, um, and I think I have a small video here. Um, so I said we want to make our things uh, generally usable. So this are, is our walking that we applied on uh, a lot of different robots. So basically all the robots in our virtual competition and also some default robots. And uh, this is why it's really nice to do this in Cartesian space, because as long as you have some IK that works on the robot and we have one which works on all non-parallel robots, uh, you can do this, uh, yeah, you can apply this on other robots as well. And uh, we hope that we can further develop the leak by making it easier to entry for new teams by being able to directly use some kind of walking, for example. Oh, sorry. Yeah, so I said that we want to make our uh, software modular. And one issue, of course, is if we have multiple modular parts of the motion, uh, that they basically can try to send joint commands at the same time, leading to issues because, of course, we cannot kick and walk at the same time, for example. Um, and as everything runs um, as, as synchronously in ROS, um, this can be a real issue. So we came up uh, with a new approach called humanoid control module, which basically adds a layer in our um, software architecture that uh, basically acts as a joint mutex, only allowing uh, one piece of software uh, at a time to control the joints. Um, it, uh, yeah, basically you can also see here a small overview of our software architecture with our main behavior on the top, um, then some certain skills like the walking, 
but uh, also like looking at some certain positions and then the HCM uh, in, in the middle between this. And basically this allows us uh, not only to solve this issue of joint mutex, but it also abstracts from the fact that the, hum uh, that the robot is a humanoid robot. So we can basically control our robot as if it would be a wheeled robot. So this allows simple tailor operation, but it also simplifies building the actual behavior for the robot. So our uh, humanoid control module basically has uh, these tasks of so the joint mutex. Then of course the fall management, that means uh, recognizing when we fall and going into a safe position for the fall, then invoking a stand up motion uh, when we have fallen down. It also handles hardware errors. So if for example, IMU is not connected or something, uh, then it will not allow any movement at all. This is a quite nice thing to, uh, prevent further damages to the hardware. You can it, uh, also press a button on the robot just to make it completely stop. That's very nice for the robot handler. And the HCM is providing to the higher level behavior some semantic state of the robot. So for example, that it has fallen down, which is important for localization, for example. Yeah, and uh, one thing that was, uh, Oh, we were asked about quite a lot during the, this uh, season was our kick, because we have a kick which can actually kick in various directions. So many teams still use uh, quite static keyframe animations. Uh, we have like a kick engine, which accepts as an input the Cartesian pose of the ball and the kick direction that we want to kick to. Um, our kick is not as far as uh, the one from the MRL team or some others. Um, we are not sure if this is uh, due also due to the robot model because we did not test it yet on other robot models, but that's something we want to do in the future. Um, and I have a small video um, of this kick um, where we do the kick uh, in different directions. So this is uh, of course done manually, but uh, theoretically if the behavior is good enough, it could invoke those kicks too. So you basically just say where the ball is and in which direction you want to kick and the robot also decides uh, on its own which foot to use for the kick. And as, as I said in the beginning, this is also done using Quintix blinds in Cartesian space. Um, so we did not yet try it out on different robots, but it should generalize quite well. And um, yeah, we use it a lot for doing passes, um, which we will also see later in the section about the uh, behavior. Of course, uh, kicks like this are a bit hard because you need to know that the ball is just behind you, but maybe with a, a good team communication, this is possible. Okay. Um, Yes, uh, we are also having some open research topics uh, in the motion section. Uh, mostly we are researching on using deep reinforcement learning. So with PPO mostly to learn um, policies for our motions. Uh, and we use our current version with the Quintix clients as a uh, basis for this. So as a demonstration, which we use for reward shaping then in the reinforcement learning. Um, and this works for our walking already in simulation um, and we are working on uh, making this also possible on the real robot. And we are also working on making our stand up motions um, basically uh, with a similar deep and reinforcement learning approach. Uh, we have also some papers uh, already published about things that I just uh, told you about. If you wanna look it up, you can look it up there. And we have some more papers uh, submitted um, and hope that we will get them published soon. Yeah, and then I will hand over to Florian for the vision. Yeah, hello everyone, I'm Florian, and I want to talk a bit about our vision pipeline. Our vision pipeline is uh, written in Python, um, but the heavy duty load is done by uh, deep learning frameworks and OpenCV and things like that. So that's not a performance concern very much for us. Our current vision is based on YOLO v3 uh, or YOLO v4 mostly nowadays YOLO v4. And we published at the uh, last symposium a paper about Torso21, which is a relatively large scale data set for the RoboCup domain, including many different labels for uh, field, uh, field line intersections, robots, but also lines, the field itself, goalposts, balls, 
and stuff like that. It includes data from both the SPL and the humanoid league. And we train our uh, YOLO on this, uh, on this data set. We are normally uh, using a tiny YOLO for the robot, but we also tried out a full-size YOLO uh, for the simulation because we have a bit of a bit more hardware there we can utilize. And the field and the lines are uh, segmented by uh, lookup tables, like normal color lookup tables that are selected manually using like a clicking tool uh, before the game. But this has its drawbacks. Um, especially in natural light conditions that are uh, prone to changes and also have different like bright spots due to the sun or something like that on the field. And it is especially hard for the segmentation tasks to be performed with a normal lookup table. So we introduced our uh, YoYo vision pipeline and it extends a, a YOLO tiny V4 model with an additional decoder for uh, semantic segmentations. So you're essentially uh, translating the image using a CNN encoder into a latent space. And then you have two decoders, one for the YOLO part and one for the unit part. And you get essentially like seen in this image um, a full vision pipeline output with one forward pass of the neural network, including the lines used later on for localization, pixel precise, you get the field boundary, goalposts, etc. You also uh, see on the right that this works pretty well in natural light conditions, um, or, uh, especially for the lion detection, uh, where you have like these harsh shadows and things like that on it. Our vision research at the moment uh, mainly focuses on uh, depth estimation where we try to do monocular depth estimation with the single camera on our robot and to uh, get information without seeing the foot point of a given object. So by just looking at, for example, the robot, see how far it's away or get an estimation of how far it's away. The torso data set I talked about earlier has a simulation part that includes ground truth information for that. And yeah, we're working currently on a paper, which also includes a bit of a real world data set for this task. And in this uh, figure, you can see a point cloud out, uh, a dense point cloud output uh, for, such a, for such a prediction, which is done by a normal neural network uh, that's predicting uh, the depth of every pixel in the input image without further information regarding the camera pose or, um, yeah, or other things. Then uh, we are doing uh, normally when we are not uh, working on the approach I proposed uh, on the last slide, we are doing inverse perspective mapping by projecting the foot point of a given object, or uh, for example, for the lines, projecting like the line pass and mask onto the field. And uh, you can see here a visualization of that. These are recently seen lines on the field used for localization purposes later on, also as a point cloud. And yeah, we're doing this via inverse perspective mapping um, with, uh, together with uh, another team or with a person from another team, we propose the Ross Sports repository. Maybe we talk about that later on, I don't know. Uh, hmm? Yeah, uh, okay. And we proposed uh, the Ross Sports repository, which uh, should, uh, on a repository organization, which should uh, unify interfaces uh, for not only the humanoid league, but also uh, with the SPL and maybe simulation leagues and so on. And we also include some general purpose, uh, general purpose repository for certain things like calculating the base footprint for navigation, or in this case, calculating uh, an inverse perspective mapping. The work on this is uh, still uh, still not finished, but uh, preliminary testing should work quite fine. And yeah, we're doing this inverse perspective mapping with it. And you can also port it for other tasks, especially the inverse perspective mapping could also be applied uh, outside of the RoboCut domain for other robot tasks. I think now Jasper right. talks about the behavior. We do the rotation maneuver again. Oh. <laughs> All right. Uh, so let me talk a bit about how our behavior is kind of structured in general. Um, I don't go into the very details of it, but uh, uh, if you want to, you can look it up. 
so what we are using is the dynamic stack decider as an architecture. Um, so it's basically a mixture between a hierarchical state machine and a behavior tree. The problem with behavior trees is they're not state or they're not really the state you cannot really read. Um, and hierarchical state machines have the problem that they kind of, even though they are hierarchical, they can explode. Uh, and you have so many transition transitions you have to take care of. Um, and for this, there's also uh, for the for the dynamic stack decider, there's a domain specific language which basically defines uh, in very abstract terms. We'll see this in just a second. Um, how the behavior of the robot is. Uh, so in general, all the information that the behavior needs is stored in the blackboard. So uh, yeah, basically any any um, anything can can uh, access this. And in this uh, dynamic stack decider, there's basically three kinds of things you can do. You can do decisions. Uh, these decisions um, are basically asking question. Uh, for example, has the ball been seen recently? Uh, you can do actions, for example, uh, go to a certain position on the playing field. And there are subtrees, which are basically just functions. So you have some more re reusability. And reusability is one of the major points we want to uh, yeah, achieve with this framework, or we, we believe that we have achieved with this framework, because all the actions and decisions, they are really easily reuse, re reusable. So uh, in this domain-specific language, uh, just a second. It looks kind of like this. So you basically have this subtree, which is called a normal behavior. Uh, and then you have the decision marked by a dollar. Uh, if the ball has been seen, each decision basically returns a string um, or an option between different kind of strings. So the ball seen can be yes or no. Um, but for example, the, the configuration for the role of the robot, which you can, yeah, you can see my mouse, right? So this could be a goalie or something else. Um, so for example, a, a striker or a defender. Um, yeah, this is the general structure of it. Um, and this is also our, our normal behavior, which we are, which we are using during the games. Um, so let me, yeah, so we have not only this behavior, this is the, the body behavior. Uh, we also have a head behavior. We found that like separating these two um, is very useful because the head usually has its own thing to do and keeping track of the head behavior in and the body behavior together in one big node or in one big software component, it's kind of tedious. So the head behavior is kind of separate and the, the body behavior gives it some kind of some kind of command, for example, right now it would be good to look for lines because it's better to have a better localization right now. Or if the ball hasn't been seen in a while, then uh, the head, uh, the body behavior tells the head behavior to look for the ball, maybe even track it. So for example, if you're dribbling the ball, you want to track the ball with your head so you always know where it is. Um, it doesn't matter that much where you are right now. Uh, because it's just important to move the ball forward, for example. Uh, yeah, so this this uh, this differentiation between body and head behavior gives a bit more freedom um, and reduces the complexity of each of those behaviors. Um, yeah, as Mark already mentioned, we also have the cumuloid control module, um, which yeah abstracts from the from the hardware, um, and this is really nice for us because uh, it allows us. Uh, not to have to focus on getting up again, for example, or having these basic ta basic skills um, that that a humanoid robot has to have, um, but to have more of a high level overview. Uh, so in our main behavior, we don't have to care if the robot is falling down. We can just yeah assume that it's always working correctly, or just ask if the if the state is controllable. If it's like right now, if it's in a um in a semantic state of being controllable um if the behavior can act right now if it's it has to wait for some kind of reaction to be completed uh so uh this is what uh, kind of our main behavior looks like um i'm not going to go into too much how it actually works if you want an introduction of that uh, 
then uh, I think it's relatively easy to read, to be honest, um, if you get used to it a bit, a little bit. Uh, but the thing I want to go into is um, that it's very semantic. Um, so basically, everything that that you see is what you get. You don't have to read the the code of how something is done, but you see just what is done. So um, yeah, for example, the the game state decider just says what's the game state. You don't have to know how it gets this game state. And this is something we really like because this simplifies the development of the behavior um, because there's basically two parts to the behavior. One is implementing these actions and decisions. And the second part is thinking about a strategy which would, which would be good. And you can separate these. And if you have developed uh, a set of actions and decisions, you can reuse them in your behavior. So oftentimes we find ourselves to need something, uh, need a new decision, um, and then just to find out we had already done something like this in the past and we could reuse it uh, and we wouldn't have to re-implement it again. So how do these actions and decisions look in this framework? They're actually relatively simple. See? So basically these decisions are just Python classes and they have a method which is called perform. And this method perform basically just returns a string. So for example, here we have this uh, method for if the ball has been seen. So we just uh, check here in uh, line 19, you can see if uh, the ball has been seen in the last so and so many seconds, some parameter which we have set. If so, we just return the semantic state yes, otherwise we return the semantic state no. Um, and these actions, they are also relatively similar. They also just have a, a perform method um, which performs this action which you want to do. But you abstract from all the technical details which you have in here, um, and you just have the, the semantic description of what is actually being done. Uh, lastly, I want to talk a bit about our gradient behavior. Um, so in order to uh, do some of these decisions, so this, in this case, the decision of um, whether to dribble or not, or whether to kick, um, we have developed a gradient behavior, which is basically saying which point um, on the playing field would be good to play uh, right now, which point is a, is a good point to shoot the ball at, or which point is a good, yeah, to, to navigate the ball at either through shooting or through dribbling. And you can see basically, this is the, the playing field, how it looks in robots. And this is the playing field, what it looks like to the gradient behavior. The, the brighter a pixel is, um, yeah, the more, um, the, the, the higher its value basically is. And um, the more you want to get the ball to this position, the goal has a very high value, of course, because we want to shoot some goals. Uh, outside of the playing field is a very low value because, um, yeah, having to do a, a um, or yeah, losing basically the ball to the outside of the playing field is generally bad in soccer. And you can see there's a dark spot, um, which is caused by another robot. So these robots can be easily integrated. Uh, if you have some obstacle, you want to navigate around and you can just say, okay, I add this into the, the um, this map. And from this map, we basically can uh, determine into which direction would be the best to kick using our kick model, which tells us how far we can kick. Yeah, so much about the gradient behavior. Uh, now let's get to the most important behavior of our robot, which is the uh, cheering at the end of the game. So this is all it is. We just ask, is the robot the goalie? And has the goal been scored in the recent time? If so, we play the cheering. And uh, unfo uh, fortunately, we were able to see this animation, I think 47 goals, so 47 times this, this uh, season. Um, and yeah, this, uh, I think this really concludes our talk. Uh, it has been a great time to um, participate in the virtual league. Um, as we said, uh, we have basically, I just want to go to the next slide. I don't know why this oh. Um We have everything uh, open source, which we can make open source. 
Uh, so we have our GitHub organization where all our repositories are, our documentation, um, which contains what we've written about uh, documentation. Uh, unfortunately, it's not, uh, there's better documentation out there, let's say. It's not all documented that well, but uh, we did our best uh, in the time we had. And then we also have the uh, general website, uh, which is also available in English, um, where you can check out our publications, for example, uh, or read our blog posts if you're interested in that. All right, uh, I think that's it for our presentation. Thank you so much. Is the documentation uh, in English also or just in German? Uh, the website? Uh, no, you say that the website is also in English. What about the documentation? Oh, it's also, it's, it's only in English. We didn't write it in German because we might have English teammates, so. Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay, thank you so much. Do you have any question for the B-Bot? So there is one in the chat. What are your current testing methodologies? Um, yeah, so we, our testing methodology is currently that uh, we try to keep our master um, branch working and if somebody implements something new, um, this person has to do a pull request um, and needs to test the things that it did. We um, did some work on automatic testing, um, but uh, yeah, we wrote a couple of unit tests for some parts of our software, but our testing is quite bad still, I would say. Um, yeah, so Florian wants to add something. The testing for Ross Sports is uh, more strict as more other teams would use that. And it's also like a released Ross package and stuff like that, or are released Ross packages. So uh, the test coverage is like pretty high there. Yeah. Yeah, and for the like for the functionality or how how well a robot performs using a new pull request, um, we run on our mach machines locally. We can run some test games uh, and see if the the expected change actually happens, if it crashes or not. Um, so, for example, if somebody wants to do a different behavior um, or change something small in the behavior, and then we can just run a test game, uh, take a look at it. Uh, and see how it works, how well it, it does compared to before. Yeah, especially the simulation environment as it exists now helped us very much uh, to improve the uh, the state of our software, let's say it like this, and, and especially in the higher levels, like behavior and things like that. So uh, that we are able to run like full scale test games with multiple robots uh, was a major benefit on this on this side. Any other question? Uh, you mentioned this repository. Hi. Thank you, by the way, for the talk, first of all. Uh, you mentioned the repository uh, Ross Sports. Uh, can you tell us a little about it? Because I have never heard about this. Um, Ross Sports, it's a GitHub organization. Uh, we started with uh, Kenji from, I think, Runswift. And the goal is to the goal is uh, to make some packages that like everybody needs to implement, like um, for example, to listen to the game controller in the ROS environment for our league, or uh, to calculate the base footprint of the humanoid robot for navigation purposes, or do some inverse perspective mapping, or have like a common standard for vision messages where not everything needs to be filled out. So only, uh, for example, the BitBot vision only implements a subset of these features, but uh, the goal is to standardize it in a way that, such that, for example, visualization, but also the exchange of components uh, can, be, uh, can be made more easily in the future. And I think Kenji has put much effort into this uh, in the direction of like documentation and things. It's still in the building process, but uh, the plan is to do like normal releases uh, on the on the ROS package uh, source index so that you can just install it with app. And uh, some packages are already released, for example, the humanoid interfaces. 
They currently include interfaces for like vision messages that are in 2D, in a 2D plane for the vision, and also uh, 3D vision messages that include like um, yeah, the projected information into the real world with the IPM, with the inverse perspective mapper. And yeah, this is the this is the reason. I, there were some ideas about including like standard walking or something like that. Um, but I don't know much about the state of that currently. No. Uh, hmm? so, so walking would not be included. The idea is to include yeah. those parts which are not on not of research interest anymore, basically, yeah. so, or never have been on research interest. So having like a game state receiver is not interesting for research. Yeah. Um, also, writing another IPM is not interesting for research. Writing your own vision is very much of interest for research. But then you just need to write your own vision and then you can directly yeah. use the IPM and get the Cartesian poses, for example. Oh. Uh, that's basically yeah. the idea. Or for example, other things that are planned are, I think, uh, the simulator interface, probably for the Humanoid League, and team communication messages and things like that. That sounds sounds really really cool. Thank you, um, but I understand correctly that this is a humanoid league thing, right? So it has nothing. No, to no, do no. With Run Swift is an SPL team. team. Run Swift is an SPL team, and we kept the focus on that it's still usable for, for example, mid-sized league or things like that and, too. And also even outside of RoboCup. So the idea is also to have this transfer from RoboCup to general robotics. Uh, by implementing some things, for example, this inverse perspective mapping, you can easily use in other robotics tasks, or we have some package of, which provide, for example, the humanoid based footprint frame, which is like is kind of a standard frame for ROS, but there is no package which computes it for you. And we did something like this and released it. So basically, it can be used for the general ROS user community uh, for any kind of project. Yeah. I see. I see. Oh, that's cool. That's really cool. Thank you. Yeah. Well, that's actually very interesting. Perhaps you can post again in the chat uh, uh, the repository so people can have a look at it. In the meantime, anyone else has uh, some other question? So I was wondering about uh, the generation, the automatic generation of the parameters for the walking. Um, have you also tried the, thank you. Uh, have you also tried the, um, for the real robot? So, so sorry, we, uh, if we tried the parameters for the real robot, was this? Yeah, a... like uh, the generation of the parameters for the yeah. walking on the yeah. real robot. So yeah. Yeah. So I will go more in details on Saturday, but generally, yes, um, we tried it also on the real robot. Um, we've been doing this also for some time now and for the walking, for the kick and for the standing up motion. And those parameters typically not work perfectly directly on the real robot, but uh, for example, for the walking, typically we only need to change one parameter, which basically defines how our robot is tilted to the front. So I think in our model, there is some difference in where the mass is in the torso of the robot. Um, but this is, on the one hand, much faster than doing everything uh, from scratch. Um, and on the, also, it's, uh, the parameters are actually better. So the, those parameters actually improved uh, upon the ones we had beforehand made manually from scratch. Because as a human, you tend to optimize towards a local maximum uh, and not try completely different parameter sets uh, because you just want to make it work. And if it somehow walks the robot, then you're fine with it, basically. Um, and yeah, for the standing up motion, uh, we um, actually did a study where we took the 10 top parameters that were optimized. And um, not all of those worked, but uh, some directly worked. And for a lot, it was like changing just one parameter a little bit uh, to make it work. So uh, generally, we are quite uh, happy with this approach. And because those parameters are quite um, semantically explainable, so something like how much is the torso tilted or how I do I rise my foot during a step, um, it is also quite easy for a human to say what needs to be changed. It's not like a parameter in like a neural network where you don't know what it actually does. 
it has really a semantic meaning. Thank you. Some other question? Uh, I would have another one about mm -hmm. your, um, you have, I don't know what you would call it. It's the human humanoid control module or something. Yeah. It's this big thing where everything goes in. <laughs> yeah, basically. Yeah. Uh, I wonder, I wonder, does that make you trouble having one module that basically takes everything or, or yeah? I, I mean, yeah, sure. If you have a, if you have a bug in it and it crashes, of course, everything, uh, nothing can, uh, control the robot anymore but i mean it's the same thing basically with any of our uh software parts where if one of those does not work the robot will not work i mean if the walking does not work it also doesn't matter uh if the rest works um so well, that's that's less my question that's less my question so i see that you split everything up nicely in small module and that looks actually really really great and it kind of looks like you you made cleaned everything up and took every little ugly code out, but it kind of lands in this one last module that still needs to be defeated or 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 I don't know taken yeah. apart. Um, is that is that correct or is that just no, necessary so to have something? I would say it's not so much correct because um, what the HCM does is basically um, yeah it it does a couple of things together, but um, it make kind of makes sense to make those together. Um, so like this whole fall management, uh, handling, um, keeping those together makes sense. And, um, I don't know further splitting up this part would may be possible, but I don't see so much of a benefit because basically this decides on some kind of low level state of your robot. Um, so which could be something like it's idle or it's currently walking it's fallen down it has some hardware issue something like this and based on this so this is basically a decision that we make using one of our dynamic stack deciders and based on this we let through goals to our joints uh, so if we're in state walking the walk engine can send joint goals if we are falling it cannot send joint goals for example um, and yeah it, it, it's a, a couple of things together but uh, it still allows us, for example, to easily change the walking. So now that we have, for example, this new reinforcement learning walking, we have like one ROS node, which is our old walking and one that's our no new walking. And we can exchange those um, without any further changes to our software, basically. Um, and this is really nice um, because this allows development on single parts of the motion uh, much easier. I also think it looks more centralized than it really is in this uh, in this figure, because what it's essentially doing is like multiplexing based on an estimated state, and so everything goes through there, but doesn't do much with it yeah. essentially. Yeah. So so basically, the walk join commands come in, and if it's okay, then it just pipes it through to the hardware, and if it's not okay, it will not it will block it but it will not do anything with those goals, basically. I see. I mean, I have to admit in our software, obviously something similar exists where everything kind of drops in <laughs> and then someone decides what of these things is actually being executed or actually being tried to reach. But to me, it always feels a little like something that should be challenged and cleaned up. I don't know how, <laughs> but um, yeah. Yeah, so but, uh, the team Newbots, for example, uses some kind of subsumption approach to to do uh, something similar like this joint mutex, um, which is a little bit more distributed than our HCM approach. But yeah, I don't know. I I like our approach actually quite well, and and also the nice thing is you can basically throw away everything here above the HCM and replace it with a manual Taylor operation script uh, and stuff like this. So this is also a, a nice feature. Um, yes, I agree. That actually looks really, really cool. Um, um, that's yeah, that's really, really cool. And you showed that you can run your code on all these other robot models. So it kind of proves also that it has a certain uh, flexibility to it. So um, that, that, that I have to say is cool. That's really cool. Yeah, this um, running it on the other robots um, is uh, works especially well because we have this uh, Cartesian-based motions um, and then a general IK that we use. 
And uh, this is, I think, the main point why it works quite well on different robots. The walk engine and the kick engine also has an IK included, yes. right? So all of those define their movements in those kind of Cartesian splines, like, like those here. Um, and then we use uh, the BioIK, it's called, it's actually a development of one of my colleagues, um, which uses um, a so called mimetic approach. So it uses, um, yeah, it's quite complicated. It's basically evolution with stochastics mixed together to come up with uh, general IK solutions. And um, yeah, and it, it is quite fast still. Um, it's not analytic, but for example, our robot does not have an analytic IK solution. Um, as far as we know, <laughs> I'm quite sure by now. So, um, I, to be honest, I think analytic NLA, uh, yeah, the solutions are thing of the past. Yeah, I don't know, but <laughs> we don't have one anyway. So I know <laughs> I didn't think so much about it. But it's fast enough that we can run it on our robot in real time, um, the IK. So we don't really worry about. Uh, making it faster. That's good. Uh, yeah, I see there's another question in the chat. Yeah, in the chat. Do you have a standalone repository demonstrating the working on different robot models by any chance that is ready to be shared? Yes, uh, I will just post it in the chat on my different computer. <laughs> uh, yeah. um, I mean, just so watching the robots, how they walk and turn in circles all day long, it's, it's really cool. Yeah, so in, on the web page, you can find a longer video with uh, more, more content and also um, a small tutorial, which I did not check yet if it works perfectly, but it at least generally shows you how to, to run the software on your own. And actually, I'm just submitting today a, a paper for the development track of the RoboCup Symposium on this uh, generalized walking. Um, yeah, so, so my hope is that new teams will can easier join the league because they just can start with a new robot uh, that at least in simulation uh, will work and walk um, direct out of the box, so to say. And yeah, I, I hope this can be a benefit for the league. Do we have any other question? So perhaps you could um, say what are the, the development that you uh, did particularly from last year to this year, because of course this, this year we all, during the competition, there were also different challenges like the changes of the lights and the environment. So how um, was a bit the main challenge that you faced for the uh, software or Hardware, uh, do you want to share some of your personal experience in uh, during the, the, the development? Uh, so I think the main development <clears throat> that we did during the virtual season was based on the behavior parts. Um, because yeah, we adapted the behavior uh, uh, quite a bit in the beginning, uh, and then less and less at the end because it got more and more risky. <laughs> um, so yeah, I think those were the, the main changes we did. Those, of course, it's, it's kind of hard to say that they are of, of research interest um, because it's still a hand-tuned behavior. It's not like reinventing the wheel. Uh, this is not like inventing something totally new, sorry. <laughs> um, we didn't have too much problems with the vision. Um, maybe Florian can elaborate on that a bit. Yeah, so in the simulation, we are just using our vision pipeline from the real world without very much parameter tuning. Uh, so uh, the changes that are done to the to the backgrounds and to the lighting situations didn't affect it pretty much. So yeah, so we didn't change much at the vision. I think most of our changes were the ROS2 migration that went on in the background, but uh, we weren't confident enough or far enough with it uh, that we were playing the last games with ROS2. So uh, we still used our ROS1 stick for that. Okay. 
Uh, so we have uh, another, yeah. So I see there's a new question. What are your main priorities from now until RoboCup 2020, uh, 20, yeah, 2022. Um, so um, the main priority is to finish up this Rust 2 uh, tra transition because there are a couple of issues left with it. Um, and then we will try to make our deep reinforcement learning walking uh, work on the actual robot and try to use this uh, in the competition. Um, I think those are, at least on the motion side, the main things that we are trying to do. We're also trying to um, do a better path planning. Um, oh, yeah. We, uh, if you look at the videos of our robot, uh, you can often see that it's uh, taking its sweet, sweet time in the end, at the end of a motion to actually find its place where it wants to be. Um, and yeah, we, we think that, uh, or we have an approach um, of using a, a footstep planning, using reinforcement learning, which we are currently developing. Uh, which we hope that uh, it could be ready for the for the competition, or at least could be evaluated during the competition a little bit. What was ready uh, for the uh, GORE? Uh, the few, German Open Replacement Event. Yeah, for the German Open Replacement Event a few, year, a few weeks back was this JoJo vision I presented. It's now uh, finished for some time. We haven't played uh, like a competitive game with it on the robot. But um, preliminary testing showed uh, it, works, it works nicely. And so we're looking forward to using it at the RoboCup uh, 2022. And what about uh, perhaps next uh, year, virtual season? So next virtual planning... season? Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> nice let, let, let us see you there. We'll there is going to be so we hope that it will continue so what will be your next step in yeah, so the the next virtual season i think we'll see uneven terrain um mm -hmm. I, I think i will manage to do that <laughs> <laughs> uh, so adapting to that would be a, a, a challenge um we'll see how much of a challenge but uh, i think at least we have to maybe uh, let the reinforcement learning uh, learn again, uh, something like that. Kicks. Uh, kicking, yeah. our kicks are not as strong as MRL, so uh, we have to work on that. Then ROS2, definitely. That's right, also that's, for, that's the, for the, for the, for the, for the Roman Cup already. Yeah. yeah. So do oh. you have, uh, sorry, you were, you were saying. No, go ahead. Uh, do uh, do you have also uh, game strategies or some uh, something that is between the, the the behaviors of the robot? Different. Yeah, so we have a team strategy in terms of the robots communi communicate their states to each other, uh, and they switch roles dynamically. So uh, the robot that's closest to the ball is going to be the robot that's uh, well, it's not really closest. Uh, it's more a little bit more complex. Um, basically uh, also taking into account how far it would be to turn um, to get there. Um, so the robot that's fastest, fastest at the ball, uh, assumed, assumably or assumed to be fastest at the ball, uh, that's, doing the, that's doing the kick, but that's, it's not really that complex of a team behavior. It's not that much strategy. We, we, uh, also we have some passing. We, are, we have some passing, like robots communicate that they will kick next time. And so the other robot goes into a pass accept position. And we have like a ball communication. If one robot loses its ball, for example, they can communicate it. And we're doing a collision avoidance with, via the team behavior with our own robots. We are also doing it with other robots. And uh, for, but for our own robots, we can do it without seeing each other through self localization and team communication. This works okay if one, uh, of, uh, if one of the robots is still, but it can lead to some issues also with opponents, mostly with opponents. And um, if both robots go in the same direction to avoid each other, for example, um, which uh, would also be. Uh, a point of uh, further investigation, possibly.
but otherwise we are playing all games with collision avoidance on like nearly all the time and have no real issues with that we still collide sometimes with each other but sometimes it works pretty well yeah as for you mentioned also uh the key, the behavior for the kicking is it just for passing the ball or uh if if your two robots are close to the to the ball how they decide which one is going to kick or they are both trying to kick uh, so what we meant by uh, we have to work on our kick is basically how how strong our kick is, how far we can hit the ball. Um, no, and... no, I meant to what um, Florian wanted to say that uh, he, one kick the ball and the other robot stop it like for receiving it is a, like a passing ball. Or yeah, yeah, we have, a, we have a passing behavior. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So yeah. But it's also considering that you're able to pass it like in front of another robot and it's also aiming with the with the dynamic kick so that it's not kicking in the back of the other robot. So this is uh, optimized by this cost map we've seen earlier with the gradient behavior and yeah. You're not seeing it that much that there is a positive region, but there is a slight positive region in front of your teammates. And the uh, and the other uh, and the opponents only have uh, yeah you're not seeing that much on this visualization and the opponents have like uh, <laughs> and the opponents have like this dark spot so you're not kicking in them but kicking to the side for example at the goalie we would not kick in the front of the goal but kick to the side as everything has like an even uh, cost in this point so we're not interested in kicking off the center of the goal and. If there is, for example, a robot to the right and it has like this positive region in front of it exposed, we would kick to that. But also if there was a robot and says like, hey, I'm able to accept the pass, we would still only consider it locally and say like, is it really worth it to kick to this robot? And maybe like, don't do it and kick to the other side instead, if that's more attractive, for example, because it's closer to the goal or something like that. But we are only doing this for one step. I've seen papers where teams do similar things with uh, such cost maps, but optimize it for multiple kicks. But um, that's too noisy for us. There's so much happening in between when we're doing that. Yeah. Thank you so much. So we perhaps have uh, time for another question. Quick question if there are any. Okay, so I would say thank you so much, Bitbot, Florian, Mark, and uh, Jasper, for sharing um, your work, your the research with us. Uh, that was a great, uh, great achievement. So thank you so much. Thanks for having us.